Welcome, I will say, family. How is everyone doing? I hope this morning has found you uh, uh, well and in good spirits and in good health and, and, and happy with where you are in life. We are the Wose community. Um, Wose is a community of the sacred African way. The way is Ma'at, truth, justice, and righteousness. We believe in the teachings of our elders and our ancestors that the creator God created the universe and all life and has placed in each of us a part of the divine spirit. God living in us and through us has given us the right and the power to establish peace and justice in all human life. The true harmony with all creations, we believe in the living faith of our ancestors. I say that is our part of our faith statement. We are believers in Ma'at. And as uh, Minister Imhotep says, I, I, I hope you test positive for Ma'at in your life right now. Um, before we uh, want to wel welcome each and every one of you here, thank you for joining us today. And as we pray together and as we celebrate together and as we, as we take in the love and happiness that is passed on from each one of us to the other, much like the virus, only this is the Ma'adian virus, I she. And so with that, we would like to begin the service with, uh, I believe we have the um, uh, a, a song Am I right? Yes. Uh, Brother Jeff, if you can give us a little music uh, in light of the drunk call to bring us all together to get all the spirits and all our vibes on one accord. I say. I say. Good morning, Jose. Good morning, Brother Jeff. <laughs> You might notice in your worship folder the words for this song. This is a new song with Stones of Fire and for we'll Say Church. It's an important song. We want you to know what the words are. Please come to the crossroads. 
Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. That is what we are talking about. Jay, that Jay. is some old stones of fire right there. Uh, <laughs> what can I say? I just want to applaud each and one. I hope you guys are feeling it like I am feeling it. So that, that particular song, I think it speaks to the whole Pan-African view that we have, that we have to be tied into all of our family, all of our people. That's, that's our blood all over the continent, all over the planet. That's our blood right there. And that's a good way to get it going, get your blood moving, I see. And right now we want to uh, uh, invite in our dear sister, uh, a runner, to, to light a candle for, for justice. If you would light a candle, share some some light in this uh, world that sometimes seems to be a dark place that you expand, you illuminate. I say, Sister Rana. <laughs> I say, oh, I'm the nap. I'm in my hotel. I am going to read from the Husia, from the book of Nefertiti, from page 86, from the second, I don't know if it's considered a chapter or a passage, but the second one on page 86. I shall speak of what is before me. I will never foretell that which will not come. A strange bird will breed in the Delta Marsh and make its nest beside the people of Egypt. For the people will let it approach through lack of action. Mm. And afterwards, all good things will pass away. Beast of the desert will drink at the river of Egypt and take their ease on the shores, for they will have no one to fear. The land is in turmoil, and no one who knows what will come to pass. No one knows what will come to pass, for what the future will bring is hidden. And as it is said, when sight and hearing fail the many, those who cannot speak will leave. Mm. I, see. I, see. I thought a lot about who or whom I was lighting a candle for today. And what stuck with me was the thought of the middle passage that we are going to be um, having Mafa. Uh, uh, for the rituals of Mahapur, and I thought about all that has happened to us, all that we have endured, all that we have overcome, all that we have saw our way through and around and above. And I thought in justice being done that there is a link that we have to address, and that is that there are generations that have passed that suffered oppression and suffered not even knowing that they were suffering because their eyes were not open to the world of Mott. Their eyes were not open to their history. There were so many drugs poured into our community for the purpose of people getting into gangs, for the purpose of people becoming drug users, for the purpose of people not having descendants that were strong of body or strong of mind. There were so many schools that were not supplied with the things that they needed in order to properly educate our communities on all levels not just at university level, but at grammar school level and at grade school level where communities of schools were looked over and things like that. There were so many generations of debt rather than generations of wealth that were incurred by people just over and over and over again. And I just felt like there needs to be justice for that. There needs to be a reckoning for that. There needs to be an awareness by those of us who our eyes are wide open to know that there are so many young people, and by young, I mean anywhere from 50 down, that don't even know 
why they are the way they are, that don't even know why they experienced the things that they did. And there needs to be justice for them. There needs to be justice now while they live. There needs to be justice while they have children and grandchildren already and don't even understand how they found themselves in those circumstances. There needs to be justice for them. So today, I light a candle for justice for the generation since passing, since middle passage, since enslavement, post so-called freedom, for those who do not know why things in their life are the way they are and just feel beat up on and beat down and don't even begin to understand it because their eyes are still closed. I ask for justice for them. You got a candle? You got it lighted? In unity, we light this candle as a symbol of our ongoing fight, as a symbol of our ongoing oneness, as a symbol of our coming together so that we are stronger together to fight those things that believe that they have any ounce of strength against us. We ask for justice. Ashe, 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 Ashe. I say, oh, ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. The candle for justice, to be able to, uh, as you say, to, to, to not to be able to see, to not know that you don't know is a terrible thing. To not know that you don't know. Um, but with that, I, I, I know we continue to work together as a community. Starts with one. I say one will sing. I say one community coming together and we grow from there. I say we do our part. They say stay in your lane, do your part. Don't try and play every position. Right, right. Just do most high has given each and every one of us a gift. I say they say, you know, the most high is living in us. Gave us I each see. a piece of itself a piece of herself gave each and every one of us some of that divine essence so that we can do what it is that we were uh, 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 divine to do. I uh, see. She. And with that, I am just um, overjoyed. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. And, and, and only thing I can imagine to come uh, behind that it would be a, a, a song from the middle of Margalisi. I mean... <laughs> Can I, is, there, is there anything else? <laughs> Margalisi, could you come and, and bless us with one of your uh, most profound songs, sir? I see, I see. We'll see. I'm in Rahitip. Just to be good to be alive, good to be in your company, good to be in your presence with the spirit of the Most High living in and through us. And... Uh, yeah, there is a, a song that I would like to share with you. Ashe. Ashe. All right. This is a song that I, that I call um, Love Everything About You. I'm in rock. <clears throat> I love everything about you. I'm in rock. I love everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you. I'm in Ra. Everything about you, Holy One. Well, I love Seb Tepe and the Spirit Mark. I love your sacred essence living in my heart. I love your truth, justice and harmony balance, righteousness, and reciprocity. I love everything about you, Amin Ra. I love everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you, Amin Ra. Everything about you, Holy One. I love the virtues, control of thought and action. 
devotion for the purpose you have given. I love your truth as you reveal it, my ability to assimilate and wield it. I love that I'm growing to know freedom from resentment under persecution or wrong. And I'm growing to know the difference between real and unreal, right from wrong. I love everything about you, I'm in love. I love everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you. I'm in love. Everything about you, Holy One. I love your spirit. The Septepi makes me free. Your essence in my heart brings peace and harmony. Control of thought and action. Your truth as you reveal it. My ability to assimilate and wield it. Asara set and son Heru. I know they did what you told them to. They laid the foundation for the sacred way. And now we can stand together and all of us can say, I love everything about you, Amin Ra. I love everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you. I'm in love. Everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you, Holy One. I love everything about you. I'm in love. Everything about you. I'm in love. Yeah, so beautiful, so beautiful. Very nice. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Minister Makalisi. Thanks and praises to the Most High. Oh, thank you, Ami. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very good. So we we having such a spirited service, uh, and Sister Rana that. That that candle for justice, girl. You you always outdoing yourself. You always outdoing. I, I'm so honored. Oh, and, you know, oh, I was, she, oh, she, she she took that spot because I was supposed to try to do it today, but it, I wasn't really able. So thank you, Sister Rona, for taking up that 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 uh, responsibility today. Today, so today again we have a sister Keila is is with us. I think for the. I don't know if I've ever seen you before, but we're happy to have you today, Sister Keela. Um, uh, Baba Kofi's here. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 Baba Katabazi. We have uh, uh, John, Brother D John Jackson, uh, uh, Brother Shamir Morer. His wife is Marilyn Jackson. Okay, uh, John and your wife. Uh, there they go, uh, Maryland. Maryland. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, Good to see you. Uh, Honored to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Bill Johnson Sister is here today, more. one of our warrior. Say what? Yeah. Keep going. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I was Brother AJ. Through. I don't know, it must be some, some static. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Sister Ikena. Hi, Ikena. Good to see you, Mama Sister. Aikina, uh, 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 Sister Sandra Lucas, of course, uh, Tanya Wei, she was here with us for a while. Uh, she's dealing with a lot, helping support family members with a, a, a young warrior who, who passed, passed recently and they're having a service today. Uh, Baba Jahi is here. Uh, Sister Mona is also here. Brother Eamon Kwesi uh, is here. Mama Bertha Rose, thank you for being here. Uh, Sister Tarima, who's, she's, at, I think, at the hospital or somewhere, mm -hmm. dealing with, helping with her. her. There yes. we go. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Sister Lenise, thankful you're here today. Now, I see, I see those babies. Uh, I see her. She's, uh -huh. okay. And Michelle Cummings, uh, Brother Suri Ali, and uh, not to mention, I don't want to, mention not mention 
our sister Nakichi and her book. Can you, can you see it? Yeah. I, I don't know. It's there. It, it. The book yeah. will show. Uh, it's not going to show. It's not showing. We got your book. So. We, got, we got our first copy. <laughs> about to ready to start to get, carting it around, taking it to uh, bookstores, you know. So, sister, in Nikichi's book here. All right. So, all welcome, right. welcome, everyone. All right. All right. And now, um, and thank you. And like I say, we, we're all here. And if we... If we miss miss a name here or there, like say, charge it to our heads and yes. not our hearts because our hearts are there with you. I shake. So now this is the time in the service. This has got to be one of my uh, most favorite times. This, it's going to be you say everything is your most favorite time. You know, Mama Conkate's prayer, that's my most favorite time. Uh, Minister Makalisi singer, that's my most favorite time. So libation, my most favorite time. Well, here's another one of my most favorite uh, portions of the service is what we call our historical tribute. I say this is when we advance and share our history of something, someone famous uh, or within the community abroad or within our own families. I say uh, events, things that have happened that have that we need to be uh, or have a different perspective on. I say that we touch on and continue to share things that have happened in our past. I say, and so we try and keep alive at least five to seven generations of, of things that have happened to us. I say that we continue to pass and move this, uh, uh, the thing, the story of our, our story forward. For those who may not know, again, there's always a reminder or refresher or you learn something. And today we have our good brother. He's the bass player. He's a new member. He's a little bit of everything. You know, the brother's profound and, and you can see each time he speaks, Brother AJ is coming up. He's coming out. So it's all inside of him. And now just like that bass, we kind of ride on that rhythm. So Brother AJ, come forward and bring us uh, today's historical tribute. I say. I say, Okay, here we go. So, so, in our tradition, we try to keep at least seven generations. I know you already said it, but in our, in our tradition, we try to keep at least seven generations alive in the consciousness of our people. Because if we don't know where we've been, then we don't know where we're going. Okay, so. I really wanted to contribute to the to the historical tribute. I've only done one, and uh, uh, Baba Ty has to. If, if I could do another, of course I have to. I want to do that. So when I first started to do this, I wanted to do it, uh, do a tribute to Charlie Mingus, who was another bass player. But when I started researching, it occurred to me that you know he's old, but there's some older guys. So then I went to Art Tatum. And I finally, I asked myself, well, who's the first African in America that was well known as a musician? And I tried to do that research. And what I came up with was this brother named Blind Tom Wiggins. So I, I, I started doing the research here. And it, this is what I've come up with. I'm going to give you just the basic here, what, what I learned about him, and tell you how I feel about it. Because last time, Baba Tai told me, don't just read. Okay, so, uh, Bill? Oh, man. Okay, you got them all three down there, huh? Okay, well, I, I won't, I'll let you put them up as you want. You can put the one with his slave master last, I suppose. That's the irony. So, here we go. Um, uh, uh, early life. Tom uh, Wiggins was born Thomas Green Wiggins on the Wiley Edwards Jones Plantation in Harris County, Georgia. Blind at birth, he was sold in 1850 along with his enslaved parents, Charity and Domingo, Domingo Wiggins, to a Columbus, Georgia lawyer, General James Neal Bethune. Uh, Bethune was the first editor in the South to openly advocate secession. Wiggins' name was variously reported as Thomas Green Bethune. 
Thomas Wiggins or Thomas Bethune, his name was changed due to his slave status. The headstone on his grave reads Thomas Green Wiggins. Now, side note on that, I, I during my research, they said they're not exactly sure where he's actually born. Uh, because Tom was blind, he could not perform work normally demanded of slaves. Instead, he was left to play and explore the Bethune early age. Uh, I'm sorry, the Bethune early age. He showed an interest in the piano after hearing the instrument played by Bethune's daughter. By age four, he reportedly He reportedly had some piano skills. Uh, he was able to uh, play by ear and gain access to the piano. By age five, Tom reportedly had composed his first tune, The Rainstorm, with a piano at age five. Neighbor Otto Spar, reminiscing about Tom in the Atlanta Constitution in 1908, uh, as reproduced in the Ballad of Blind O'Neill, observed Tom seemed to have but two motives in life, the gratification of his appetite and his passion for music. I exaggerate when I state that he made the piano go for 12 hours out of 24. As a child, Tom began to echo the sounds around him, repeating uh, accurately the crow of a rooster or the singing of a bird. If he, was, if he was in the cabin, Tom was known to begin beating on pots and pans or dragging chairs across the floor in an attempt to make any kind of, of sound. Tom was able to repeat conversations up to 10 minutes in length, but was barely able to adequately communicate his own grunts, uh, communicate his own grunts and gestures. Another example of Tom's extraordinary ability was shown after he was taken to a political rally in 1860 in support of Democratic candidate Stephen Douglas. Years after he attended this speech, he was still able to repeat it while capturing the tone and, and additionally, he was able to recreate the heckles and cheers of the crowd with remarkable precision. Bethune hired out Blind Tom from the age of eight years to concert promoter Perry Oliver, who toured him extensively in the U.S., often as, four time, as often as four times a day, and earning Oliver and Bethune up to $100,000 a year. An enormous sum for the time, equivalent to 1.5 million today. Blind Tom undoubtedly, uh, uh, making Blind Tom undoubtedly the 19th century's most highly compensated pianist. General Bethune's family fortune estimated at 750,000 at the hands of Blind Tom. Oliver marketed Tom as a Barnum style freak advertising the animal to art. In the media, Tom was frequently compared to a bear, baboon, or master. And I think that's terrible. That's, that's just how we've been treated. Here you have a genius, but they want to call him a freak. Anyway, uh, Bethune hired professional musicians to play for Tom, who could faithfully reproduce their performance. Often after a single, he learned, uh, he earned uh, a reported 7,000 I'm sorry, he learned a reported 7,000 pieces of music, including hymns, popular songs, waltzes, and classical repertoire. Blind Tom circa 1861. There are conflicting historical accounts of Blind Tom's first public performance, some indicating he was as young as three years old. One indicates that he had been performing publicly for several years. Uh, newspaper reviews and audience reactions were favorable, prompting, uh, prompting someone to undertake a concert tour with Tom around their home state of Georgia. Tom later toured with the South with the Zoom for, uh, and was accompanied by, uh, through their travels and bookings, they were sometimes hampered by the North-South hostilities which were driving the nation towards civil war. They weren't in civil war yet, apparently. And he was, by the way, on the Confederate side. So, you, you, you know, usually everything we hear comes from the other side. Mark Twain attended many of Blind Tom's performances over several decades and chronicled the proceedings. Tom often referred to himself in the third person. Thomas pleased to meet you, say things like that. His piano recitals were other talents including uncanny voice mimicry, public 
figures and nature sounds. He also displayed a hyperactive uh, physicality, both both off. A letter written in 19, in 1862 by a soldier in North Carolina described some of Tom's eccentric capabilities. One of his most one of his most this is this I'm sorry that this is going like this, but I copied this into my word pad and, and there's some stuff missing. Uh, but basically he was able to play he would play one song with his left hand he would play another song with his right hand, and then he would whistle a whole nother tune at the same time. He was absolutely a genius. He was uh, held back. He was exploited. And then uh, in 1882, John, uh, John Bethune married his landlady, Elisa Stubach, who had demonstrated a knack for mollifying Tom, sometimes volatile, uh, uh, attitude. However, shortly after their marriage, John Bethune embarked on an extended tour of the U.S. with Tom. And what ended up happening is she, she tried to sue, they ended up getting divorced, and she tried to sue General Bethune to have custody of, of, uh, uh, of Tom. The bottom line is that this man was a genius. He was autistic as, as well as being blind. And in spite of that, he made a ton of money for his owners. In the end, he, uh, he uh, wanted to get back with his mother. And uh, 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 General Bethune's ex-wife blocked that. So it, it's, a, it's a tragic story. I would, I, what I wanted to say on this tribute is that I would encourage, because unless uh, Minister... Uh, Unless the speaker today tells me I'm wrong, I think this is the first African American to actually make money in the music industry for, you know, uh, uh, for our presses, for our owners or whatever. Uh, and I have to apologize for being so tongue-tied here. I should have gone straight from the web, but I wanted to, I wanted to get the major points out. The major points are that this man was a genius who today uh, you, you just have to imagine what he could have done, autistic or otherwise. And uh, I don't know if my 10 minutes are up. I haven't heard from Bob Ty. I really wanted to try to get it all in here. Blind Tom Wiggin. If you look that up, you will find that it's a, a, a little bit of a bigger story. And it's definitely worth knowing this man. So how are we doing, Bob Ty? Uh, your time is about up, my brother. Okay, okay. I really, you know, I, 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 I probably, I'm trying to learn to do these tributes. I plan what I have planned, and I hope to do one a month on a different uh, musician, starting from this era and moving forward. And I, I promise you all, I will do better in the future. So, for brother, brother Blind Tom Wiggins. So I'm going to join in with Brother uh, AJ, and we pour a little libation for. Uh, hey, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Can you yes. see me? Yes. I think I can. Uh, no, we don't. Oh, you can't? OK, hold well, on. No, I just, just, just turn your camera off somehow. There okay, you go. Yeah, all right. My apologies. Ashe. 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 Ah, Shay. Ah, right. ah, Shay. Excellent. 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 I mean, I mean, just the 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 genius of the genius of our of of us as a people. I mean, I can I, I can't imagine. They say that he was blind and he was autistic. Man, he you was know. Autistic. I want to say one other thing. If you yes. don't do anything else. There are people, he has a song called uh, The Battle of Manasseh. He's the first one to incorporate what they call bombs that they didn't start doing until like the mid-1900s in classical music. And, and if you go, you can find 
renditions of, of, of people trying to play his music. You go and listen to the battle, it will blow your mind. I, I, I guarantee you, I'm a musician. And when I heard this stuff, I was like, wow. Wow. Brother, Brother AJ, yeah. spell, you saying Manasa, the battle of Manasa, M A N A, yes. yes. something like that, S A? M A N A S S A, I believe. It's one of his most famous pieces. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. In that piece, he's doing three different things at the same time. Okay. All right. And you brought it today. Don't, you, you, yeah. you, you did a beautiful job. Thank you, brother. brother. E e e oh, e e you did beautiful. E e excellent job. And I want to uh, uh, thank you for, for uh, laying that out. Now, speaking of, um, of a, a, a genius uh, uh, keyboard player, it was just a natural, uh, it's a nat natural tie-in as we talk about the genius of these keyboard players. We talk about the genius of our, our, our artisans. We talk about the genius of what we have. Uh, we are blessed today to have a song by uh, Baba Damu. Uh, Brother Damu, are you here with us today? I see you. There he is. I see you. Ah, yeah, yeah. Your, your your sound is off. You can, you can if you there. Uh, <laughs> okay, there yeah, I got you. Go. All right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good morning, Jose. Uh, Good God bless morning. you. Uh, Thank you for uh, having me back. I'm going to do something today to um, let's try to put everything in focus, which is really hard to do uh, because I want you to do something that would be in memoriam of Blind Tom, uh, and at the same time, uh, in keeping with one of uh, something that is consistent all the time through Jose. And I just thought of uh, our meditation services and how important that is. I know that's a real important uh, segment of the worship services for me. So I thought I would do this song by Sister Jean Corn. It was uh, first written by her husband, Doug Corn. Well, no, it wasn't written by Doug Corner. It was written by the late uh, McCoy China, who played with John Coltrane. And then uh, um, words were written to it by Sister Jean Corn, um, because th this is the Jean Corn version of the song Contemplation by more McCoy China. So please play, pray with me, Wose, uh, because I had said I wasn't going to sing. Uh, but the spirit led me to uh, attempt to sing anyway, so pray with me, help me to get through it. Now there's one that's 
soul so blind. We must find a way to get back home. Sit down and work it out. See what it's all about. Search till you find. Better try or you die home. But a child of Ada is bound by his own fear. You were free from the day you were born. So find a place of your own, a place where you can survive, a place to be alive. Concentration. Thank you, thank you, thank you, brother. Brother always comes with something. Where you, where, where? Sudi, I tell you, boy, I, I take my hat off to you. I had one on because you are always bringing it, brother. You are always bringing it. Well, thank you for that. Um, now it is the that time in the in in our service that, as uh, uh, I think Mama and Gina likes to say, you know, we have to pay the light bill. Uh, this is that time when we uh, give of what we have in our storage shed, what we have in our storage rooms, what we what we have. And in these days and age, we're talking about what kind of uh, money can you put in, you know, whatever it is that we actually need the contributions from each and every one of you to keep everything going, to allow us to uh, keep the lights on at our building. It allows us to uh, um, to make the contribution that we do to other parts of the community. So for right now, I'd like to ask uh, Mama Ngina and uh, Baba yeah. Katabazi if you would come on and uh, help us with the litany. Ashi. Ashi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Tap to speak. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I can't see if I'm... Good morning. But anyway, um, am I there? I, I still can't see. But anyway... Okay, there, um, yeah, there it is. I am so grateful and thankful to be a part of this. It is so wonderful. We've had good service already, and I am just so amazed at the uh, amount of energy that we can project over these waves in the air and so happy to see everyone brother tyrone from san francisco has joined us for the last couple of weeks and welcome back so if we can all in our imaginations hold hands and and start our litany again this is a time where we give back what is in the storehouse needs to go out we cannot sit on what we have it is a blessing to be able to give and praises for those who are unable to give so we all know this let us start our litany of sacrifice together and we say save us O holy one by your name vindicate us by your might Hear my prayer, divine protector. Listen to the words of my mouth. How can we repay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us? 
we will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the God of our ancestors. We will fulfill our vows to our creator in the presence of all our people. Gladly, we bring our sacrifices to you, O Holy One. We praise your name, O Amun-Ra, for it is good. And our first principle is Umoja, unity. We shall strive to maintain unity and the family, community, nation, and race. Uchichagalia, self-determination. We shall define, name, create, and speak for ourselves. Ujima, we will build and maintain our communities together. Our brothers and sisters' problems are ours to solve together. Ujima, cooperative economics. Together, we shall build and maintain our own businesses and together profit from them. Nia, purpose. We shall make our collective vocation the building and development of our community and the restoration of our people to our traditional greatness. Kumba, creativity. We shall do as much as we can and any way we can to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherited it. Imani, Imani. faith. We shall believe with all our hearts in our creator, our people, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. And now we all know how to give um, the way that we've been doing via the internet. So now I will lift up a, a prayer. So if we close our eyes, and I say, oh, Amun Ramos, hi. We give you thanks, oh, Holy One, for life, health, strength. We give you thanks and praises for this Wose community, our Sacramento and Oakland communities being together. We give you thanks for those in Mississippi and Alabama and in Florida and in Washington, D.C. and all over the place. We are so grateful and thankful, Holy One, that this circle remains unbroken and that we can still be here together. We thank you for having a building that belongs to us, that's paid for, but there are still bills. We are grateful for those of us, and most of us in this community are blessed. We did not lose our jobs. We still have income. And that's a blessing. And we say thank you. We thank you, Holy One, that we know that you are the wind at our backs and that you are the sun in front of us. We thank you for the youth and for the elderly. We thank you for all of those that have lost their lives, their homes, and due to these fires and this pandemic. 2020 has been a roller coaster year, but we know, I know, that you are in charge and that this is part of the plan. We thank you for our individual collective families that are all well. We ask special prayers for Sister Thundiway's family and what she's going through. We ask blessings for Sister Connie's. Um, her friends, family. I thank you for my mother-in-law that is doing well after her stroke. I just thank you, Holy One, that our families are well, that we are well. We ask blessings for those that are suffering. But we, again, know, I know, that the Most High is in control. We ask that these offerings be multiplied, 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 so that we can do what we know to do. We feed the hungry. We clothe the naked. We give water to the thirsty. We give a boat to those who have none, because we are the followers of the way, and the way is ma'at, truth, justice, harmony, reciprocity, and that's what we do here at Well Say. Thanking you for all of those in my listening voice 
And just the, the historical tribute shows the goodness of the Most High. There was no sight, but the genius showed up in other ways. That is awesome. God is awesome. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let us all say, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. All right. Well, thank you, Mama and Gina. Um, uh, uh, Baba Kata Basi. As you see, we've moved out from outside of the uh, the uh, uh, virtual uh, comedic tomb, and now we are back in the in the office within our household. So, uh, with that, now we're going to move on to another one of my favorite parts of the service. How many favorite parts do I have? You know, I have, <laughs> so don't we say Jay? Don't say it no more. I think I, I shared with people. I had like. Um, uh, nine aunties and one uncle. Uh, my mom had, it was 11 of them. And so coming up, each one of my aunties was my favorite auntie. So I've been doing this since I was young. You know what, Auntie Sophie, you my favorite auntie. And I moved right over to the next one. You my favorite because they all was my favorite. So uh, that's where we are. But this is one of the favorite parts of um, of the service for us. This is when we get the message. and. What I'd like to share about the brother coming up, uh, 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 Professor Maynou, uh, I remember some years ago, kind of analogy, some years ago I was staying in Atlanta and um, there was a conference for the infusion of African studies in the public schools and was put on by Dr. Asa Hilliard, the John Henry Clark, there's about 500 educators there and they needed some entertainment. And so, uh, I was able to get the contract. And one of the things that they asked for was that they heard that there was an African uh, martial arts. They didn't know anything about it, but it's like, let me ask you and see if you can find it. And I was able to get uh, from Oakland Seafood, Bill Owens, and he flew down to Atlanta. He and his brother Basol, and they, they, they turned it out. But it was that, you know that something exists but these are educators. They didn't have the time to do the study. And so that's why they came and asked if I can do that. Well, we have this brother right here, uh, 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 Professor Maynou. We understand the greatness of African people. We understand the greatness of the Nile Valley of civilizations, but we just don't have all the information. And it's so wonderful when you could say, uh, say what you just said. You know, uh, she'll give them some of those 40 years of study that you've done that you can verify what I know in my heart, which is true. All right, Shay, so at this particular point in time, right now, I'd like to bring on uh, Professor Maynou to bring today's message. And he is the one who's done the study. He's done the research. He's done the field work. So now he can bring us and tell us exactly what is going on, what we intuitively know, he can put verse to word, word to verse, and share it with the world. So if Brother uh, Maynou, if you would be so kind as to step forward and uh, bring us some of this knowledge you got, sir. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Sidney. I, I appreciate it. Good afternoon, uh, family. Good to see everybody this afternoon. And I, I just want to share with you some of what I've been able to learn over the decades. And, you know, one of the things that has really inspired me allowed Africans to be great in the old days, to look at what it is that allowed us to be at the apex of human achievement for millennia. And there's nothing more appropriate than to look at structures that defy, uh, that defy time. So there's nothing more permanent more enduring that lasts over time in the desert than the pyramid. So I was inspired to share some of my uh, primary research with you this morning to talk about African pyramid science, uh, science. And it's not really about building actual pyramids in the U.S., but it's to take the principles and practices that allowed them to build these mighty structures that still confound the world even in the 21st century so in a few minutes, that's uh, what my task is. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative of uh, all of the energy 
and uh, the genuine enthusiasm this, this morning and, and this afternoon. So I'm going to show slides as, as usual because somebody said a while back that images are worth what they say. I think they said something like a thousand words. I don't know who counted. I don't know if they're worth 999 words, 1,004, 1,005. All I know is that images are impactful. So for me, it's about looking at African traditional culture and African spiritual culture from an inside point of view. So I'm going to abbreviate just a little bit of uh, what I want to share with you. And, um, and, and Brother Sidney mentioned educators in Atlanta, and it kind of brings to mind that when I first presented this, this topic, it was actually in Atlanta in 2011. And a few of you may have been there, but it was the second Nile Valley Conference. The first one was in 1984, the historical one in, in, uh, in September of 84, where I participated in the second one 27 years later, which was in 2011. And it was like a five-day conference. And you had people from various countries and educators and, and people focused on chemitology here in the US. And I was actually the, the opening night keynote speaker back in 2011. So I'm going to give you just some of um, some of what I know about these enduring structures. So I'm going to focus on the origin and purpose of, 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 of Nile Valley pyramid science. And so uh, we'll put you on the inside of the story. Well, one of the terms is a uh, deshret that has to do with the desert. And it's important to really understand the desert environment because most in the West don't know much about the desert, but in Kemet, they clearly, you know, that the whole Nile Valley, or much of it is in a desert environment in the Sahara. So it's really a wilderness or an abandoned place. And this is how it's presented in the Medunetra inscriptions, like, uh, you know, but one of the things that's interesting is that about, even though 30% of the earth is, is desert, it's still very limited research on this type of terrain, the, the, either the desert or the semi-arid environment. Uh, one myth is that people think the desert is somehow man-made. It's not. It's, uh, it's part of a natural flow in nature. And one of the reasons that I know that is because um, I was able to do work in a NASA-sponsored a NASA research project back in the 80s to look at the ebb and flow of, uh, of the cycles. But uh, one of the great uh, reasons why there's so much misinformation is because the field of geology or earth sciences that began in Europe. And there's very little desert environment in Europe. So those who really originated the earth sciences, studying rocks and so forth, they don't have any experience in their part of the world. So they have really misled uh, many people. So there's not, there's not been a lot of research done because the environment is very hot. And if you've gone to Kemet and the further you go south, it's hotter and hotter. And, and so many black people go in the, uh, in the summer. But those that do research, they don't have the uh, the same kind of uh, they don't have the same kind of melanin content, so they don't go during the summer. They actually go in the winter. So the excavation season, the research season, a uh, season for mainstream people is normally in the winter months, maybe October to maybe around March or something like that. But black folks, we have melanin. It helps us to uh, absorb the energy from the sun. So we typically go in the summer but others don't because of the, the tough terrain. And then, you know, um, a lot of the environment is not really, uh, it's, it's not really rocks. It's a mixture of sand and rubble. So when someone goes in, it's very difficult to really understand the environment is what I'm saying. So a lot of what people think they know about the desert really has little to do with facts. This is crucial and critical because the ancestors in the Nile Valley were astute students of nature and they integrated with not only plants and animals but the entire environment and so when you look at the whole desert map you see this whole area of the sahara this is where the greatest concentration of monuments and pyramids were built and many don't know the origins of it because they don't know the natural environment that inspired these enduring monuments so uh, so the origin of this pyramid shape or the pyramid form is indigenous to the region and so um, as I was mentioning, I worked on a project some years ago, so we can actually look at the climactic history, the wet and dry alternating periods in, uh, in Africa going back at least 300,000 years. There's wet and fluvial periods and there's dry periods. And this really has helped to shape 
and mold the desert landscape. And so the reason why this is important because it is these, 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 uh, these natural monuments or, or the natural wind, the natural environment that actually has shaped these pyramid or these conical type natural structures. And, it's, and so that is what's important that the wind helps to create these forms and shapes. And if we know that, then we can really um, understand where the ancestors got the idea of creating these pointed stone structures or pyramids, these great monuments that confound the world. And, and let's, one thing we should know is that the only structure over time that, that uh, survives over time and that endures is the pyramid shape. It is shaped by wind and sand, and that's what uh, creates the great structures. These structures. So, for example, we have natural land formations up and down the Nile Valley when you're out in the desert environment. So these are not structures made by by African builders. These are natural land formations. Here, here my camera was acting a little bit funny, but anyway, you can see <laughs> you can see at least a few outlines uh, having an, that look like pyramid shapes. But you see it everywhere, up and down the area. Here you have natural formations that are created over time and shaped by wind and sand. Now, if you take a close look at this image, for example, you know, the area is really hazy. So sometimes it's very difficult to see. But if you look carefully, you will see a pyramid type shape looming in the background. And this is it. It's a natural formation. It's not built by human hands. It's not built by African stonemasons. Now these are, these are some of the Abu Sir pyramids. And by the way, there's over uh, 111, 112, 113 pyramids in Kemet. So we're, and that's only half of the pyramids that are further south in Sudan. But in Kemet, there's, you know, there's about half of what we find in the south. So you see these pyramids of Abu Sir, and this is during the pyramid age, during the fifth dynasty or so. And um, this is when they were building these monuments for eternity. Now, if you take a look at this, at these two images, one is a natural land formation and the other one are actually remains of a pyramid. So the question would be, which one do you think is natural? Which one do you think are the remains of a pyramid during the pyramid age? Now, you might find it surprising that all of the pyramids are, don't remain and are, and, and, and are perfect. But what we know is that the further we go back, the more perfect the pyramids. These are later pyramids. Uh, this is a later pyramid that doesn't quite survive like the earlier ones during the pyramid age, which goes back to at least uh, 48, 4,700 years ago. So if you take a look, one is a natural land formation, the other one is a pyramid. So you take a look and so the natural land formation is on the top and this is a pyramid of Sahure on the bottom. This is the fifth dynasty pyramid that you see. So again, it's you know over 4,000 some odd years. Also, there's uh, other shapes like Kerna. This is a mountain in the Valley of the Kings. You see the one at the top here. Kerna means horn. It means horn, like a rhinoceros horn. It means horn. And so this here, even in the Valley of the Kings, you find a structure that is similar to a pyramid shape. And then here's another one. This one certainly does not survive as well. The, the, the Pyramid of Teti. It's an important pyramid because of the pyramid text inside, but the outside structure doesn't really survive. But I just wanted to show you that because nature had a direct influence, including yardangs. You might ask, well, what is a yardang? A yardang is, it's a wind sculpted landform. That's what a yardang is. It's a, so the, the ancestors were inspired by nature. It's a wind sculpted landform. And this is what, uh, and so wind erosion predominates in the area and it shapes and molds rocks. And, and these rocks look like monuments that are constructed by African builders. That's what's called a yard, a yardang. So there's the yardang influence that uh, the Africans uh, use in their local environment. So take a look, for example, at the greatest and most well-known and most powerful statue in the history of humanity, Haru M. Akin or Haru in the horizon, or the so-called Great Sphinx. This is the single greatest statue on Earth. And you see that this is in Giza, it's down the hill here from the, from the middle pyramid. And you see here the different images of the same monument. So it's a 66 foot high monument, 240 feet long, made out of one single block of limestone. If you take a look at the picture here on the right, 
give you an idea of what 66 feet looks like. Here's the great statue and mon uh, monument here, and here's a man in the box. You say, I don't really see him. That's my point. The man, <laughs> the man is pretty much insignificant. But I want to show you uh, the influence of nature in, in constructing the greatest and most well-known statue in the history of humanity. So take a look at this yard name. It's in the Western Desert. So in other words, in the Western part of Egypt, you have these naturally wind sculpted, uh, what looks like uh, sculptures, but this is shaped by wind over time. This is, these are yard dangs. So take a look here. You take a look at the natural structure, both for the left and the right, there's kind of a close up, but you take a look at the yard dang here and it's not very different. When you take a look at the, uh, the natural Yardang and the original image or the original uh, image of a king, of a ruler, 66 feet high, 240 feet long. And so the Yardang looks pretty similar. And that's what you have in the area. You have these wind sculpted uh, structures that really remind us of monuments. So why am I emphasizing this? Because there's no reason to, to go to Mars and look for interplanetary travelers. You know, it's like the, like, like the ancient aliens and this kind of nonsensical series. There's no reason to go there when there's, there's monuments right in front of them. So this is the greatest statue on Earth. It is right here. And so uh, take a look. And while we're at it, let's make sure that we know that this is not only the greatest statue in the history of humanity, but is unmistakably an African, a brother. There's no question. Look at that Africoid profile. It doesn't matter that someone chiseled off the nose. It wasn't Napoleon. But uh, it was someone else who chiseled the nose off, but the Africoid facial structure is quite obviously, let me give you a close up in case you don't have your contacts or glasses on this morning. A look at the, the juicy African kissing lips. The lips are meant for smooching and for affection. This is clearly un unmistakably an African, a brother running the nation thousands of years ago. And here you have some of the original paint, which is hard to see with this image. This is facing to the east, and you can see that the sun is not on the face, the sun is on the headdress. So this is a little bit in the afternoon. So if you go, you want to go in the morning, you can get the best shots. I have some, some great shots, but this is the one that I was able to pull up uh, this morning to show you. This is the other side now of this, the most well-known statue on Earth. And by the way, this, this would have been blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue and yellow. That's, that's what would have been the original color. But take a look at some of the original brown paint to represent the Africoid skin tone. Let's give you a close-up. This is part of the original paint of the greatest statue on earth. And so Africans carve images that obviously look like themselves. So it's important to know that, that they were inspired by nature to create images of themselves. And this is the greatest of all of the examples of that, of that fact. So let's take a look at uh, the issue here, the evolution of pyramid construction. So let's dismiss and dispatch one crazy idea that aliens did not build any pyramids in Kemet. So the ancient aliens uh, nonsense that you might see on the History, History Channel, let's do away with that. This is the first superstructure in the history of the world, or the first stone building, the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, about 200 feet. And notice that it's six different levels. This is the first level here. It's received some damage. This is second level, the third. You can count on the fourth, the fifth, and sixth. So this is the oldest stone building in the history of humanity. This is important because what we've been told is that there's been um, you know, some aliens coming in who have built monuments in Giza. So that makes no sense. So when I take people to Kibbit, I show them the evolution of pyramid building from the first step pyramid to eventually the true pyramids uh, that predate the ones in Giza. So there's no reason to look for interplanetary travelers from Mars, where we can see the evolution of pyramid building in the Nile Valley. There's a 40 mile stretch of pyramids that loom in majesty in the desert. And you can see the, uh, the evolution of this structure. So take a look at this from another angle. The people on the right, the bottom right, again, you don't really see them very much or very clearly because that's the point. They're really insignificant. Now, let me point something out is that Zozer is the king, the ruler, the pharaoh, the per ah which means great house who commissioned the building of the step pyramid that you just saw. And so, uh, and you know, and, and take a look at his Afrocoid skin tone. He's wearing locks as he runs the nation about 4,800 years ago. And so he's the one that 
commission the structure of this, uh, uh, the construction of the building. Inside of the step pyramid is beautiful turquoise. Some of it today is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Other parts of it is in the Cairo Museum. But notice how great and beautiful this would have looked in its heyday. But this is on the inside. And so now there's no such thing as a pyramid by itself. There's always a pyramid complex with connected buildings and with rituals and ceremonies. And so connected to the step pyramid, the first stone building in the history of humanity is a half said court or the Jubilee Festival would have been in this huge court here. This is very significant because this is, a, this is the first actual physical structure of the head said court, where the great Jubilee Festival would be, uh, would be reenacted. In other words, the whole festival was to, was to rejuvenate the Ka, or the spiritual double of the king. Now, the foreign Egyptologists thought that the head said festival was every 30 years, but then they find out that no, it's not necessarily every 30 years. It's not a set date. This ceremony, this ritual where the king has to, has to show his not only physical fitness, but his spiritual fitness because his ka, his spiritual double represented the ka of the entire nation. So the Hepset festival would take place whenever the, the kings, whenever they de determined that the kings, the per us, his spiritual energy was low. And so what you see here are two pavilions. And one would, would represent the pavilion, pavilion in which the king would have the crown of the south, and the other one would be the crown of the north. So you always see these two uh, pavilions to represent this elaborate ceremony that would take place. So for example, if you look at artifacts, for example, even when you're reading the Metanature inscription throughout the entire time period, you see uh, not only uh, uh, the, the name of the king here, but also the titles of the, the ruler of Upper and Lower Kemet. You see all of that, but what is missed if a person is not looking very carefully, as you see here on uh, the vessel, and this is a, a uh, this is a representation of an amulet. You see the pavilion here. This is probably even more clear. This is the pavilion, and this represents a throne where he has on the southern crown and the throne of a northern crown, but it's about the Jubilee Festival. So whenever you see this symbol, it, it relates to an elaborate ritual, a multi-day elaborate ritual where the king's ka is being strengthened and rejuvenated because his ka, his, his energy represents the ka of the entire nation. So anyway, so that's what you see inside of the Zoser pyramid. He's performing the Heb said festival. He must be fit. He must dance before the um, the creator. And here he has on his crown of the south. So he's physically fit, but it's not just a physical scene. It's also a spiritual scene. And this is why you will have the Heb said festival, this powerful jubilee festival whenever there's a need to strengthen his ka. And guess what his name is? His other name, and there was five names for the king, is not just Zozer, but you know what his other name? Netcher Ket. So Netcher is the name of the creator, and Ket is body. So this is his other name, Netcher Ket, or divine body. What a name for a king. So he's representing the divine body. So it's always special. So it's not just a building. It's much more than that when we look at pyramids and the rituals and ceremonies that take place. Now here's, uh, so we looked at the step pyramid. Now here are several other pyramids built by one king, Seneferu, the founder of the fourth dynasty. We're told and misled to, to think that the, the tombs, I mean, sorry, the pyramids were tombs. They were not tombs. None, hear me well, none of the early pyramids were tombs. They were never intended to be a tomb, and that's why there's no burials, no bodies, no skeletons, no mummies remaining. They, uh, these weren't ransacked by robbers and looters. There was never any attempt to bury. These structures are not based on simply being a tomb. And besides, how can Seneferu build not one, not two, but three pyramids? Which ones was he gonna be buried in? He would not move hundreds of thousands of tons of stones and then say, well, I changed my mind. Let me try another design. Doesn't work that way. Anyway, so this is the evolution of pyramid building. We showed you the step pyramid. This is the second one built after that. This is the Maidun pyramid, not medium. No, it's Maidun. And so the Maidun pyramid is just after the step pyramid. No one knows what happened here. 
if uh, why they stopped the construction, but this would have been, this is over 300 feet. It's a very steep angle, but it was never complete. But no bodies, no people were found in the rubble, no tools. So who knows why they stopped? But it's interesting to look at the Maydun Pyramid and all the pyramids have a, have a north-south orientation. So if you ever find the opening, it's, it's a northern side. And what's interesting about the Maydun Pyramid, you can see the inner core of the masonry, what the stonemasons were doing in order to try to figure out what were these structures about? How did they construct these powerful monuments that still confound the world? So the Maydun Pyramid, you can actually go into uh, the pyramid and I'm leading some people inside to show them one fact, that there were no barriers inside and there could not have possibly been any barriers inside. So the tomb theory that these pyramids were tombs, it really makes no sense whatsoever when you go inside and actually do the physical investigation. So after Maydun, so Nefru then, uh, he started the, another major project. And this is the Bent Pyramid of Dashur. And notice that it's called the Bent Pyramid today. Notice that there's a change in angle. Right around here, it's a change in angle. And it's a gentler angle here. It's not quite as steep. So they make a change in construction mid-course. So it's called the Bent Pyramid. It's, it's equivalent to about a 34-story skyscraper. And this uh, white limestone, it's amazing when you go to Dashur because it almost acts like glass, you know, in the um, in the midday sun. It really kiss it kiss off of the limestone and and it's really brilliant, almost like glass. But anyway, so after Maydun, then the great builder Senefru, he starts the bent so-called bent pyramid. They change the angle there, and there's different theories about why he may have done that. But at the same site at Dashur, the same king, the great builder himself, Senefru, builds the first true pyramid. This is the first true pyramid. These are before the ones in Giza that people are familiar with. So if we look at the evolution of pyramid building from the Step Pyramid to the Maydun Pyramid to the Bent Pyramid at Dashur and now the so-called Red Pyramid, the stones are not red and never have been red. So I call it the Northern Pyramid at Dashur because it's more accurate to call it that. And this is the first true pyramid. So why would somebody need aliens to descend in Africa and start building pyramids, we can see the evolution of pyramid building right there in the local area. And so again, this is the northern part, northern orientation. You can see see the opening. And this is, by the way, this is about going back. This is about 344 feet or 34 story skyscraper. So if you go up about 200 feet and you climb all the way up then you can actually go inside. So I told some folks who had a fear of heights, said, let's go, let's go, come in, let's show it to you and you can check it out. Look at the spectacular inside of the Northern Pyramid in Dashur. So uh, everybody who wanted to go, some were excited, some had a little bit of fears to say, let's go, let's make it happen. So there's three chambers inside. When you go into the first chamber, there is a, a, a tremendous structure inside where they're moving huge tons of stone. So in this first chamber, you go up 200 feet and what goes up must, must come down. You come down the stairs and then there's the first of three chambers. And this is about a 40 foot high corbelled ceiling, corbelled ceiling. And uh, there's 11 courses. If you count these, there are actually 11 of these going up 40 feet. So when people are inside of the structure, they look up 40 feet. I say, okay, now you got to, beyond this ceiling, now it's another 300 feet to get to the top of the pyramid. And I try to estimate, I think this block has to be at least 50 tons, at least that. When you take a look, and by the way, when we go into the other chambers and then we're, when we're on our way out, that's, that's when I point out to people <laughs> that there's a crack, <laughs> that there's a crack in the stone. <laughs> by that time, they've already been in and no one <laughs> can be concerned about it then. But anyway, but this is inside. And so you got one person building three pyramids. And guess what? All of the pyramids I just showed you are before the ones that the History Channel claims were built by the interplanetary travelers from Mars. So why would they come and build pyramids and then ascend back up to Mars? And this series, by the way, is still being run. But why would they do that when, in fact, there's a whole tradition of pyramid building? And that's really the key, that pyramids built by Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara, African, African Communal Cooperative and, and Collective Works Projects that were built to last for eternity. So the, so, that, so the old saying is this, and it still holds true, that all the world fears time, but time itself fears the pyramids. These monuments were built to last for eternity. 
And these, these, by the way, are people in the boxes to show you how insignificant people are. So uh, this is, uh, th by the way, Kubo's Pyramid is the largest. It's 481 feet, equivalent to a 48-story skyscraper. So Africans were building on a grand scale, to say the least. And these stones on the outside are about two and a half tons each. And on the, on the inside, you have 15-ton stones. How did they even move them? How did they quarry these huge stones? How did they put them in ships to move them to this particular location? It's engineering at a whole nother level. It's African science at a whole nother level. And so uh, tremendous, I'm just gonna move through these faster, but anyway, uh, Khufu was the one that commissioned the building of the largest of these great structures, one of the greatest builders in the history of Kemet. This likely is also Khufu as well, the face of African rulership, building millennia ago, monuments that still confound people. They're trying to figure out how do they even do this? Uh, so, all right, so anyway, there's no, no uh, aliens involved, definitely no slaves involved e either. For the past 30 years now, the evidence has been quite definitive that no slaves built any pyramids in Kemet. So let's do away with this nonsense, some aliens coming in to build for Africans, uh, monuments as if Africans could not build. It, can you imagine this is still being promoted today? What kind of academic nonsense is this? This is phony and fake and outrageous. So what do we know about the labor that built the pyramids? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is what we know. We know that the labor was organized in Zaz, a za. A za was a work unit, a work unit or a work gang. That's how the labor was organized. They were organized in temple service, in mortuary service, as well as public works projects, such as building pyramids. So what is the, what is this term, Aza? During the pyramid age, during this time period, the division of labor was called a za. And in the middle nature inscription, this is how it looks right here. It's like a hobble, you know, hobble to keep, it's around the leg of, a, of, of, of cattle to keep them uh, close together. So za really translates to be protection. And there were five Zahs that actually was, were rotated. So it was rotated in. So they would work for about three months. Uh, different regions was, would come in, work for three months in these public work projects. Then they would go back to their local areas. And that's how the labor was organized. Now we know the details. It is interesting because when the foreigners come around much, much later, the Greeks, they uh, changed every name. So for the Greeks, the Zah became known as a phyle. And they defined, the foreigners defined the phyle as a tribe or a clan which makes sense because these Zahs, it, they would take people from different regions. And from those regions, different groups would come in and build the great public works projects. It was, a, it was these were all national projects. And the Greeks called them a tribe or a clan, which, which uh, helps. So even when foreigners come much later, sometimes their ideas help. So we know that the Zahs were based on regions. And then also there's inscriptions as well. We know exactly um, how people worked or each group worked what they were doing, what they were called, what days people worked, what days they had off. We now know that from all of this. So one other thing here is that I want to point out that the pyramids, in terms of no slaves, we now have definitive evidence. This was, this was always clear anyway. But near the great pyramids that I just showed you, Khufu, Khafre, Menkara, here's the great Harua market. And then this is the Nazlet El Simon village. Well, just off uh, to the left here, just off to the left, there's, there's Het El Garab. And this is the urban area where the pyramid builders lived. And so now there's definitive evidence since 1991. And this is a part of the site, so it's not that far from the pyramids, but this is the site where the urban center was, where people were simply leave the, what's called Het El Garab today, leave the urban center, the city area, and they would go and build these great monuments. And so uh, it's, it's an active uh, excavation site, even though it's, it was found in 1991. It's one of the most important sites, which, which clearly put to rest this idea that slaves built the pyramids. We know that people they worked seven days and then had three days off. That's what a week was, 10 days. Worked seven days, three days off. They were paid with grains of wheat, grain of, grains of barley, and with linen cloth. And lots of things have been found since the excavation work, uh, pot fragments or pot shards, plastic pottery in the area, the bakery, the brewery, different tombs have been found in this area. 
is no question. And then the documents indicating when people work, when they had days off, clearly indicates that slaves had nothing to do with it. You see a structure here that still remains in the old, uh, in the old urban environment. So the evidence has been very clear about no slavery whatsoever. Here, I'm probably a couple miles from the pyramid in the background, but that monument is so large, it may look that I'm a lot closer. But let me show you the tomb evidence so you'll know. So in this same area, Hut El Garab, um, Het El Garab, this area here, there are tombs, there are burials, as I said, bakeries, breweries, you name it, everything is there. And when you look at some of the tombs, it's important to know that this is where we have the definitive evidence of how, uh, more evidence, I should say, of how these Zaz were organized. So here is a, a tomb. You can't probably see the metal nature that closely, but here you can see kind of more of a close up. You see some of the glyphs here, but take a look at the left. Here you have the official. You see him, he's seated. This is his left arm. He has a, uh, an emblem of, of power in his, in his arm, uh, on his left hand. And this is his wife. His wife is seated here right behind him and she has her hand uh, around him as is always the case. But what's important here, when we take a look at the evidence from the, the urban area, we have the titles of those people and we know exactly the work schedules in some cases as well. So overseer of the side of the pyramid, the director of draftman, overseer of masonry, the director of workers, director of the king's works. And so each of the Zahs, they were named, they were, they were uh, outlined, and then there's the individual titles of those who were the high officials that organized the labor without enslavement, without exploiting labor. They're able to build the great monuments. And so it's definitive since the uh, early 90s. And uh, so slaves, there's no evidence of any slavery at all in building these great monuments. We don't know how pyramids were built. This is the only evidence of how large colossal statues would have been moved. And uh, here's 172 men pulling the huge statue of Jehuti Hotel. This is not during the same time period. This is, is much, much later, but this is the only large image that we see an image of or picture of to give us some kind of idea of how these large blocks of stones were, were moved. And so wherever you see a person here, there's four. There's four, there's four. So it's four, wherever you see a person is four. And notice that you got row, you got four people on, wherever you see one, there's four, and there's several, several rows. What are they doing, you might ask? They, they all are pulling the string, you see? So they're pulling the string, the strings are tied together to pull this huge statue. And it's kind of like on a sled here, as you can see, of Jehudi Hotep. The man here is pouring a liquid to reduce the friction. And what is the man doing on his knees or his lap? He is clapping. Why is he clapping? To provide the rhythm. You know, and that's, that's what it's about. It's about a work rhythm. And that's what, that's what the man is doing here. And so it's 172 men that's pulling this huge statue of Jehudi Hotep. This is the only scene that clearly shows how they may have moved large stones. And this is not from the time of the pyramids, it's much later, but we have to look at all evidence to get some kind of idea of their construction techniques. And so um, let's show you one other thing here before we indicate what, are, what were the pyramids actually for? Why did they build the structures? They certainly were not tombs. I've already indicated to you that Seneferu built not one, not two, but three pyramids, and none of them were tombs. In fact, none of the early pyramids, including these, were tombs. No bodies found, no skeletons found, no mummies found. This is one of the greatest uh, ongoing myths, is that these were tombs. They were not. Nobody was ever found in them, and there was no attempt to bury anyone. So if you take a look at Khufu's pyramid, for example, uh, here's a close-up again, millions of stones, averaging two and a half tons on the outside. But if you take a look at this great structure, this is the inside of um, the Pyramid of Khufu. And this has been called, which is crazy, this has been called by outsiders, by foreigners who don't know anything about African, uh, African archeology span and African engineering. They call this the uh, King's Chamber. And this is supposedly the, the, uh, the King's Chamber. These are just made up terms that make no sense because Africa's never buried anybody hundreds of feet above ground. That's why there's no burials found in the so-called Queen's Chamber 
in the so-called king's chamber. There was never any attempt for a burial. Even this underground subterranean uh, passageway here, there was no burial, no attempt for a burial. It's just a, kind of a pit and that's all it is. So this uh, tomb theory makes no sense. No one's gonna be burying somebody hundreds of feet above ground. Makes no sense, no sense. Now what this diagram does show is that there are some shafts that looked at and looks at the uh, some uh, star systems, which I mentioned before I close. So that's important to know. So you can go inside it and you can go to the subterranean chamber or the upper chambers and you'll never find any evidence of any burial. Here's a man, this is what you normally see, He's given us the old tired tomb theory. You know, when they put it on TV, somebody thinks it's accurate. It's not accurate. This is this is not a tomb. Not at all. So this is not a tomb, but this is what's presented over and over again because they say this is where Khufu was buried. Really? Well, this is actually wider than the passageway that uh, that um, it would have had to come through. They would not bury him before. But they're going to bury him before they finish the pyramid. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, the tomb theory is quite suspect. It's, it doesn't line up with evidence. So what was the pyramids for? What is the purpose of the pyramid construction? It's actually explained in the pyramid text. Okay, so one thing to know is that this is science at its best. So you've got astronomy and astronomy. So they were able to actually set their calendar. The first solar calendar in the history of humanity they were able to really understand the star systems by using uh, these pyramids as like a gigantic clock. You can tell the time of day and, and almost the season of the year based on how the sun casts a shadow on these pyramids. So if you take a look at Khufu's pyramid, notice that it's every side represents a perfect triangle. So you got one side, a second side here, a third side on the back. It's the same thing, it's a perfect triangle. This is the same pyramid here from different angles. And if you have four equilateral triangles, as I'm pointing out here, that means you have a perfect square. How about that? They're building massive structures at its mathematics at a sophisticated level. So it's astrology and astronomy and it's rituals that would have been performed inside of these structures. And that's what we know. So when planes fly above, you can get these aerial views of these uh, powerful structures. Now let me show you what we now know. Well, we've been knowing it for a while, but Here's the evidence of what the pyramids were really for. Here's uh, uh, Usakov. This is his pyramid. And then you see the step pyramid in the background. He's a founder of the fifth dynasty. That's the dynasty where the pyramid text or text inside the pyramid is, uh, is found. And so the text inside, this is the fifth dynasty, but the first pyramid that actually has text inside the fifth dynasty pyramid of Unus. And this is his pyramid here. You can see part of the original uh, stone on the outside. It is not that far from the actual step pyramid, but it's at this place where we get the insight about what in the world were the ancestors doing when they were building on this kind of grand scale. Slaves didn't do it, aliens didn't do it, and these were not tombs, so what was it about? Well, if we look at, remember I said that every pyramid is a whole complex. This is part of the causeway. There's a mortuary temple a valley temple, everything, there's a whole complex of structures. But when we actually look inside, you have these beautiful monuments. Somebody's got to mute themselves there. So we got the, the beautiful uh, painting on the inside of the Unis Pyramid. And uh, if you take a look at this, it's absolutely stunning. This has been closed for some years, but those who might have gone in earlier years, you can see the beautiful um, uh, painting and uh, 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 on the inside of the Unis Pyramid, it's not only painting, but it's the writing, the pyramid text. So if you take a look at the sky, this represents the stars. That's what it represents because it gives us a clear insight about what the pyramids were really about. The text tells us. The early fourth dynasty, third dynasty, there's no text inside. But when we get to the fifth dynasty or the fifth family of rulers, that's when we find out about what all this really means. And so this is why Unis' pyramid is important. Look how perfect the glyphs are. If, if you don't have glyphs that are based on harmony, balance, and proportion, then it ain't really Meru Netra. It is not when the time when Africans were in control. But during the pyramid age, it's perfect glyphs. 
as you can see here. Look how perfect you should, you can make some of these out. You don't even have to know Medu Nature, and you can still make out some of the glyphs. The Ankh of foot here, as you can see it. Notice the Shindu, a so-called cartouche. And look at this is Unus's name here, and it's there. Now, the pyramid text, let me read some of the pyramid text so you get an idea of what it was about. So what is really all of this about? Why is the pyramid text so important? Because it explains what the pyramids were for. And we look at the pyramid text, and, and each of the texts are called an utterance. So let me read some of it so you, so you get an idea, like utterance 258, for example. Here the king, he leaves the earth for the sky. And remember, the king is representing the, the spiritual health of the entire nation. So it's not just about the elite. It's about the entire nation. So he leaves earth for the sky. And the text says this, the king is Asar in a dust storm. He detests the earth or the ground. And Unis will not enter into Gad or the earth, lest he perish, lest he sleep in his house, his house upon earth. His bones are strong. His eels are removed by the two kites of Asar, meaning Aset and Nebet Het. And so Unis, the text tells us, has become pure in the eyes of Haru. Unis is bound for the sky, and the king is bound for the sky on the wind. So the text is telling them that, telling us the wind is helping him to ascend. It's all about ascension. That's what this is about. It's about ascending and, um, and eventually being identified with the sun. There's other um, text that tells us that the king is identified with the sun, literally. And so uh, it says, like the text says, that the king rests in peace in the West and that all the inhabitants of the Duat, the place of spiritual transformation, they serve him and you know, they become his servants. And then it says that Unis shines in the East. And there's many different texts that says that the king becomes a star or he's ferried over to the sky. Text says, other text said he climbs the sky on a ladder and that the ladder is knotted together to help him ascend. There's so many different things in that. And then, and then when, he, when he gets to the sky, he's admitted. And it's all about the resurrection at that point. He, when he becomes one with the sun, S-U-N, then he is part of the resurrection text. So it has nothing to do with just someone being buried in the tombs. No, there's no burials even in his tomb, but there is about the resurrection, resurrection text, text. Notice this one, utterance 260. Now the king, he, he claims to be now that he is, uh, that he is, he is like Haru now. He's ascended like Haru. And Haru represents the day, the sun, is different names that mean the same thing. But the text says this, I am the image of my father. I'm the blossom of my mother. I detest traveling in darkness, for then I cannot see, but I fall, uh, I fall upside down. And I bring forth today, and I, and I bring Ma'at, for it is with me. So he's bringing Ma'at. And one thing you should know, one of the worst things that someone can happen to someone in the spiritual world is to be upside down. That's one of the worst things. They say I've not become upside down because think about it. If someone's upside down, they do the opposite of what is healthy. A person is upside down, they'll drink urine, eat feces. It's, it's, up, it's an upside down person who they describe. And I think we got some upside down people among us in America. There's no question whatsoever. So as we come together, as, as uh, Sister Kanke was saying earlier, this is our work. We use the word work, but our work is to continue to preserve our way, which is the way, because we've got a lot of dirty, upside-down people around us, and it's clear. The text consistently says that I've not become upside-down, and that's one of the things that people were avoided on a regular basis. So the text says that the king becomes a star, literally. It, it, the tech, one of the texts says that Unis has cleared the night and he's dispersed the stars. He's now become a lord of the night. The man has become very strong. Other text says that he has now joined the imperishable stars, the stars that do not perish. And so the text says this, utterance 412, you should lay hold of the hand, hand of the imperishable stars. Your bones shall not perish. Your flesh shall not be rotten. O Unis, your members shall not be far from you because you are the because you are one of the natural or the, the gods. 
And finally, one other one I'll point out to you is the utterance 442, where he's become a star. That's what the whole goal is, about coming a star. And so when I'm reading the text, later on we get these images in the Valley of the Kings. Now the, the pyramid text does not have these images, but they're describing becoming an imperishable star. And then we, when we go further south during a later period, now we have the vivid Im imagery of someone becoming an imperishable star. And that's what you're looking at here. And, and here it's all about ascension. Take a look at these scenes. These are not in the pyramids. This is in tombs that are much later, but they give the visual imagery, uh, uh, imagery of ascension. So notice the king riding on the back of a serpent. Serpents are usually negative, but not when you have the words of power and you can make a negative serpent uh, powerful. So in the dark area, in the duat, where spiritual transformation takes place, the image shows that a fire spitting uh, serpent is uh, controlled by the words of power. And, and so instead of spitting fire in one's face, that powerful serpent is turned around and using that, that, that uh, fire spitting ability to lighten up the way, to light up the way. And now he's what? He's ascending among the stars. Notice the snake. It's like a caterpillar, caterpillar turns into a butterfly. That's what you have here. You have transformation taking place. Notice the wings. Notice a man with one body but two heads, representing the northern crown and southern crown. And here's one of the last texts I'll share with you. It says the sky, or Newt, conceives you, Sa, or so-called Orion, and the dawn light uh, bears you. Um, and it goes on to say that you will regularly ascend with Sa, or the so-called Orion, from the eastern horizon in the sky, and you will regularly descend with Sa into the western region in the sky. So the king now has become one with the sun. He rises in the east and sets in the west, just like the sun does in this daily cycle. And I said Sa because that's the word that they use for so-called Orion. And even here you see imagery. You see the imagery having to do with the whole constellation. And that's what you find is that this is really what it's about. It's about a spiritual ascension. Uh, there's no bodies in there. So it's, it's more than just focusing on burial. It's much bigger than that. And it shows a profound understanding of uh, astrology and astronomy. Details. This is why it's the first astrolo accurate astrological understanding and the first solar calendar in the history of humanity because of millennia of careful observations of the heavenly bodies. And so that's what you have here, different deities that they're showing. And if you take a look at the pyramids in Giza, you got Khufu, Khafre, Ben Karat. They're not quite on the same line, not quite. If you if you, if you line it up here, and but notice, as I said, you, if you got four equilateral triangles, you got a perfect square. You can see it here. This is a square. This is a square. But this is done on such a colossal scale. But notice the third pyramid, a little bit off. That's on purpose. Here's an actual photograph of the Sa or the so-called Orion star belt two bright stars and a third one pretty bright not quite but it's a little bit off and that's what this is all about it's all about a a, a a an understanding standing of these heavenly bodies and creating a whole comprehensive system that very few people have any understanding of this is why the outsiders just throw out that these are tools and it's not the case whatsoever this is africans having a sophisticated understanding and this is a part of their cosmology and their spiritual practice. And so integrated in all this is day-to-day -day life that's uh, based on the principle of Ma'at. And then others have written about this as well. But I just wanted to at least give you an overview of this tremendous topic of what these great monuments were for. And they loom in majesty even now, thousands of years later. So we must always give the utmost respect to the ancestors who were in fact building for eternity. And so uh, anyway, so I now grant you all as experts on what the pyramids were for, but it's really about rituals and ceremony and an astrological and astronomical understanding so that uh, it's about ascension. And the pyramid text tells us that very clearly. So I end by uh, thank you all for taking it in. So now I grant you all as the as those who can now go tell others, one who learns, they teach. So I'm pouring libation to those ancestors 
who provided the greatest example in the history of humanity. And we could do no better thing than to build for eternity. There's nothing that's second rate or second class that I respect. I never will. So we must do our best the time that we're here. And we must make sure that our work, our names, our legacy lives for, for eternity. And there's nothing special in small things. You know, and, and there's also nobody likes a foul name. There is nothing worse than a foul name. When we, when we name you know, and, and talk about the ancestors, we're elevating their contributions because their contributions are set in stone. And no one, no one can put a sheet over it. So anyway, um, I say, and that's, that's my libation today. Ah, thank you, Professor Maynou. All right. Hey. Hey, everybody's a star. Everybody is a star. Want to thank uh, Professor Menu Ampim for his great work. He taught us about the geology of the desert, talking about what it means. He showed us that glyph. He also told us, showed us the natural forms, actually forming the pernetter, the 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 pyramid, the the mer, uh, a symbol already in nature, and then it actually gives the uh, a sign of what people call the Sphinx in nature. He gave us that. He talked about the Yardangs. I never heard of Yardangs. He, and, and so he, he gave us that information. He, talked, he told us about the three uh, pyramids of Seneferu, Ch talked us about, told us about the Bent Pyramid. And then he, he took us on a tour of the work unit. Yes. He, t he showed us that it was not slavery that, that built these things, but it was actually people coming together and working, but all, not, not only building, but maintaining. You know, it's one thing to build something, but then it's another thing to maintain them. So those crews were working uh, three months at a time. And then he, he took us to the tomb of, of Jehudi Hotep. He asked us, why were the pyramids built? What was their purpose? And he talked about advanced mathematics, astronomy, and, and using the pyramid texts and the guides. And he told us that we were stars. And so the invitation to you today is if you'd like to uh, become part of our constellation, if you, if you would like to be, uh, you know, ascend the stars, actually ascension is mentioned in the Husea. And, and it is, and, and some of the text that he is uh, uh, quoting, uh, the utterance 258, utterance 412, utterance 442. You should look that up. You should look up at, you should go do a search, not right now because I'm talking, but do a search on the pyramid text, utterance 258, utterance 412, and utterance 442. Dr. Obinga has have those utterances in his book, African philosophy, the pharaonic period. So he's he's ta he's talking about ascension, and we're and we're offering you a chance to join us in this ascension process and become a member of Wose. Would you come today? Would you uh, extend your hand? Would you mention yourself in the chat um, as we look around? Uh, <laughs> Manu for president. I saw somebody put put in there. So all right. Uh, I, I don't think he, I think he wants to be higher than that, as, as, if, if he's the uh, main new Ampium that I know. Um, we all got big brains now, yes. Okay, give thanks, man, for, for that. Is, is there one that would like to come? We have 54 participants in this Zoom right now. We extend the invitation uh, to, brother, to those that want to join us along with uh, Professor Ampium uh, in this ascension process. Would you come today? I see a beautiful picture of uh, of uh, uh, Brother Katabasi. Man, you look so distinguished uh, with your with your beard there. All right, now uh, I I check with brother uh, with brother Desmond and uh, and he is going to uh, close be able to close us out with the song "Lift Every Voice and Sing." I believe that's what he told me. So. Baba Sydney, if there, if you'd like to say something before we um, uh, have that uh, closing by Bob, uh, Brother Desmond. Oh, I was just saying. I mean, the the comments are are just so spot on. Uh, uh, I, I'm right there with Menu for maybe not president. We're gonna have to come up with another name. But uh, this brother is spitting fire. He got the smoke going on. 
Uh, man, it's just so wonderful to sit Somebody there called the fire department. Yeah, is man. Just, all right. Like I said, is that, you know, this is where we go. That's like I say, met, met here. Explain it to him what we think and what we feeling, you know, so he takes our innermost uh, 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 feelings and intuition and puts it into words, puts written written down. Here it is, imprint right there for you. And uh, I like that. We all got bigger brains now. I know I'm feeling smarter. So. <laughs> hey, can, I, can I say something? Uh, someone has a thumbs up. I don't know if that's a hand raise or a thumbs up, but a Leon's phone. I just wanted to make that known. Leon, Brother Leon, give thanks. Brother Leon is actually a member of Wose, uh, uh, uh Sacramento. Oh. And and I'm glad that he could join us today. And I and I and I see an original member of Wose Sacramento, Mama Bertha Rose. Uh, she when we talk about the people that met with uh, Tashaka uh, at his place, you know, with Bill and and Marilyn Newfield, Bertha Rose was one of those people. So I'm glad to see her uh, with us today. All right. Can we give a second hand to? Baba Manu on peace. Yes, yes. All of that information. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But now again, again, I'm asking you, I'm I'm begging you, please, please, please go and look up utterance two fifty eight. Utterance 412 and Utterance 442. He he gave us an assignment. You know he's a professor, you know, so he gave he gave us an assignment. I that's the way I took it. So go check out utterance. 258, where where uh, the, the king is talking about ascension. Go and check out utterance 412 and utterance 442, becoming a part of the Dwat, becoming one, uh, one of those beings that is with the imperishable stars. The imperishable stars are the stars that never disappear from the sky. And that's the way we want to be, uh, and, and we want to leave our mark here on this earth. Give thanks again, uh, Professor for that wonderful uh, 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 message, for that wonderful teaching. Also, uh, Professor uh, Ampim has a book out, uh, and um, I had it up. And, and But, you know, you can get it on Amazon, but you would rather get it from him so that he can autograph it. So uh, I'm just going to ask, um, I know it's 1 o'clock, Professor uh, Ampum, could you just tell us how we could get your latest book on Nubia and 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 you know the one that you're using uh, in your classes at uh, Contra Costa College? Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you can go right to my website, which is mainuampim.com. You can get it there, or also on uh, advancingtheresearch.org, and you can get it there. It's only twenty four ninety five, and I, I told Brother M. Hotep that uh, if he buys it through Amazon, I won't sign it. So that's why. He <laughs> yeah, so, he so said, hey, would you do would you do us all a favor, Professor, and uh, put that in the chat? Those things that you just listed, so that we can go directly, okay. uh, and and uh, we can go directly and and purchase your book, and so that we can learn like the other students are learning at Contra Costa College. Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Desmond, uh, uh, Sydney. I don't have the uh, the the uh, uh, thing up. The schedule. Okay. The, the uh, schedule up. I yeah. had it at one point. I think Desmond is is. Uh, it's time for Desmond to come in and close us out. Is that okay? Yes, correct? sir. That's where we are. Okay. Uh, Brother Desmond. Thank All you. Right. We'll say family and Baba Sydney, and hopefully, thank you guys for being flexible with me and. Allow me right. to do lift up your voice and sing. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm nervous because I haven't sung in a long time. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do a um, getting permission from you guys to do um, a remix. Is that okay? <clears throat> lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise, I as the listening skies, let it resound loud as, loud as a roaring sea. In the song full of faith, full of faith that the dark past has taught us, the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of hope, 
Full of hope, full of hope that the present has brought us. The present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on, let us march on. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Oh, is one. Oh, let us march on till victory is won. All right. Give thanks yeah. for that. And they will hey, sing a my, new song. They will sing a new song. All right. Now, let's uh, join hands together. Now to them who is able to lift us up faultlessly before the throne on high, may they empower us to be a people with one aim, one, one vision, one, one, one vision, one faith, one, one, faith. faith. one destiny, one, one, destiny. one, love. one, one love. love, one heart, one, heart. one God. One God. Let us call upon the name of that one God as our ancestors and elders have done for countless generations. For time immemorial, let us all say together. Amen. In the Zoom land and, and in the Duat, you are the most beautiful people on the face of this earth. Amen. Ashe. Hey. All right. All right. All right. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Mm, mm, mm.